Hello there. So I wanted to share with you a talk I actually did way back in 2017 at Bangor Design Conference, which is way out in the middle of Wales, um, but as a fantastic university and design course out there. Um, and I was on stage with a bunch of other, um, should we say, mid-career and later career design professionals. And I realized that when I was looking at the run-up, there was a lot of people who had done tremendous things. And I think that's always really impressive when you're a student. But at the same time, you know, it, it's just human nature. You always polish your story so it sounds a little bit more effortless than it really was. And uh, I wanted to maybe come in at a slightly different angle and, and actually share some of the the sort of mistakes and wrong turns, as I think certainly the fact that I've even done two degrees, I started off in chemistry before going to product design and engineering. Um, I've had a far from straightforward or linear uh, career path. So I think uh, I would have appreciated someone with as messy a path as I had uh, when I was a student, let's say. So with that in mind, I, I kind of lifted the Steve Jobs quote of uh, everything makes sense by joining the dots in hindsight. And that was a little bit what I was trying to show that um, it's as important to know what job that you want to get, but equally important is knowing how to craft a story that makes sense to your prospective employer, or indeed if you intend to go on your own and form a company that still needs to have a narrative that impresses investors as well as consumers. So there's actually, uh, I did this for three years. This is the first. Um, I would like to think that they're different. Um, I sort of tried to address different topics working with the tutors, but this one's a little bit how you sort of frame your story. And indeed, if you're trying to get uh, your first gig um, as an internship, that age old catch 22 problem of how do you get experience when you don't have any experience, I hope to cover a bit of that as well. So um, it's far from perfect, but I hope it's useful. So let's go. So joining the dots. Uh, dot one, in the beginning. This was me uh, and one of my best friends, uh, George and we had been making cardboard boxes uh, into dinosaurs and just having a great time. And I look back and think this was really sort of where it got started, although at the time I just thought we were having a lot of fun. So 22 years later, I ended up working on the BBC's uh, Big Life Fix, which if you haven't seen it, is all of these people, with the exception of Simon Reeve, are designers and engineers and makers. Um, who were basically given tasks to say these people have various uh, limitations in their life or things they can't access due to a disability or a problem. How can we use uh, a combination of sort of makery skills and technology to help them lead a better life? And so this was an absolutely, I, I love this series, I love being part of it, and it was something that I'm incredibly proud of. Um, and I hope that we keep making things like this in future. So, um, because of, in case you're wondering why I'm not playing the video, it's owned by BBC, so please click in the link below um, and it'll, it'll take you back out and I'll pause me and come back to it later. So, hope you enjoy it. So, hope you enjoyed the video. Um, it, it, it's, it's still one of those things that kind of blows my mind every time I, I, I see it, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, it, it's especially poignant given that when I recorded this, James was still with us and now he's actually passed away. So the fact that this really was, you know, as he had intended, a legacy for him is always something that I feel, to be honest, quite quite emotional about. And uh, it isn't often that you get those sorts of design challenges where you really do something that's dedicated for one person. <clears throat> so... Um, yeah, to sort of go go through the sort of process a little bit for the benefit of, uh, you know, if you're in a design course and you're looking at, you know, user-centered design, how do you break down a problem? Um, these are just some of the slides from the show of where we had, we had started off saying to James, okay, how are you going to zoom and focus uh, the, 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 the DSLR? And in case you're wondering why James couldn't just use an iPhone, um, it was one of those things where... He really had loved using, before he lost the use of his hands, um, his, his DSLR and, and getting really good quality pictures. And so for him, it just wasn't acceptable to go over to a smartphone. And, and indeed, I think there's, you know, there's some validity in that when you speak to any other professional photographer. Of course, James had done both, but this was his throwing down the gauntlet to challenge it and say, I really want something that is uniquely my style and my vision. So 
the reason why we've got this uh, photo in the uh, top left is is also because this is James driving a car, which is just, as you can see, truly extraordinary that he was able to do this. And I think he was the first person in the UK to do this. So dare I say it, I, I was actually not worried about James's determination. I was worried about my ability to solve the problem. Uh, so there we go. So I started off by actually, um, if you like, going back into something I've been playing around with, which was how to, to, to trigger the shutter by using essentially a little foot pedal. And so I, I thought, well, we could do that because I knew that James could move his feet. And again, this is sort of for the design students watching this. Sometimes it is that thing of you have to go out into the environment and meet the person because James didn't write to me and say, by the way, I can use my feet because you know, given the description of his condition, you would have assumed he can't use his hands, probably can't use his feet either by the same virtue. But again, do not let assumptions uh, take away an opportunity. So I happened to be working for a company called Sugar at the time. And even though it wasn't endorsed or underwritten or supported by them, um, I, I nonetheless loved the product and wanted to, uh, you know, embellish the camera and try and make the button squishy so that James's delicate skin wouldn't necessarily split or tear when he was pressing the buttons. And so I thought as a, as a way for me to just get going with what James is about, I thought this was a really good start. So as you can see, 3D printers at work and you know, you don't have to get into the mechanics, but it's quite intuitive really that if A, James can't grab hold of something, can we make it so he has a, a lever which he can push and pull? And as you can see, this is this is really quite a long stick that I was having to put on it before it felt comfortable. So I had like three different lengths and it really needed the longest one to reduce the force on the moment so that James could actually turn it round. So that, that really brought it home to me that this wasn't gonna be the quick fix, that it needed some sort of electromechanical intervention. Otherwise, as you can see on the next picture, you know, we got something that was a lot more integrated and, and was using servo motors. So, the dots. I wanted to give a little bit of framing of just my background as well, that I'm not going to go blow by blow for all these pictures, um, but I'd worked at places like Dyson, uh, which is the cutaway motor. I'd worked for the NHS. I'd done whiskey packaging in Norway. I've helped make space pods with RS components done, uh, you know, sort of messing around in nature has always been a big thing, work with cardboard a lot, uh, you know, recently had a job at Lego doing uh, exploration in technology, and again, just doing cool projects, like this was Suguru, which was sort of making uh, a Gatling gun rainbow water pistol. Um, I recently become a dad, and so making a little toys has also been super cool. But I guess I'm also like really into the engineering side of things and uh, trying to sketch through my ideas. And I guess I sort of threw in the little pottery thing as like quite often the stereotype of an engineer is you don't really do art. But actually, this was like a huge passion of mine for about six years, and I think still informs even these very nice cup of tea today. So. Again, a little bit of diversity will always help your folio, I think, with employers. So my CV, I wanted to take you through that um, I started off, you know, it looks like I trained in product design engineering, interned in Hong Kong with Ieste. Please make a note of some of these uh, organizations if they're still running. Um, Ieste is absolutely terrific because essentially it has a system where it's almost every university puts their cards on the table and it's like a shuffle. Um, so basically I got to go to Hong Kong because I managed to get help from someone in uh, my old university to take a student like for like. So basically it, it means the sort of tuition fees are zeroed out uh, if you come from a richer or a poorer university, etc. So basically it's an incredible scheme if you have no experience. Please take a look at it. I also did a sandwich uh, year in Norway uh, using the Erasmus scheme. Again, all these abbreviation names, go check them out. And I also interned in California uh, with BUNAC, which essentially allows you three month visa uh, with minimum stress uh, in America. So graduated in 2009, worked for Dyson, two years and two years, uh, two years in engineering, two years in design. And I kind of thought, well, that's all well and good. So I'd done a little bit of design modeling uh, workshops and led a team of R&D uh, at Sugru, which was absolutely terrific. So I ended up now, at the time, scouting for Lego, and that was a really great job. 
Um, so I think what I wanted to point out is that, you know, the, 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 the edit, if you like, is that I actually graduated as a chemist first, and then I was completely lost after graduation, didn't really know what I wanted to do. I worked in uh, three jobs, butchers, statistician for the local council, um, and a horticultural specialist, which to this day I still consider to be the hardest job I ever did. Uh, it was pushing around 80 hours a week, and... Uh, you know, if you ever wanted someone to live up to these fictitious, you know, maverick CEOs, then actually, strangely, this is still by far one of the most, you know, rebellious and unique people I've ever met. Although a little bit at times quite intimidating, um, but certainly completely blew me away. Um, but I realized that I needed to get back to doing something that was actually lending itself to my actual, you know, should we say in, in real passions. And so I'd actually credit to uh, Seymour and Powell uh, that basically their Better by Design series on Channel 4 was actually what made me think it's better to just try this than continue to bang my head against the wall in careers that aren't working out for me. So I retrained, in fact, in product design engineering. Um, and at halfway through all of this, I got assessed for dyslexia, which may or may not have accounted for some of the slightly more wobbly results. But safe to say, I think even though I, I've hoped I've never used dyslexia as a sort of a crutch or an excuse, it's still one of those things that's worth getting tested for if you think you're in that sort of uh, spectrum, because sometimes the, the learning and the coaching you get from the support teams means you understand yourself a bit better and you know how to operate a little bit better in the world. And certainly now that I'm married, I, I at least find ways to just, you know, remind my my partner to just put post-it notes up for me or I'm just going to forget it. So there's all these little things that sometimes click from being assessed. So anyway, uh, I completely failed licensing my final year project. Um, I, I guess I can't go too much into it, but let's say that it's a, a, a really terrific project with the NHS. And even though we had, we had patented the design, it won a ton of awards, the simple truth of it is it only resulted in a few hundred deaths per year. And although, you know, probably we think, oh my gosh, a few hundred people a year die of this, in the grand scheme of deaths due to surgical equipment, it, it's actually nothing. And and so, you know, I can't name names, but I, I had been around the big companies and in, in confidence, they had sort of essentially, you know, I think quite, it, it was quite brave of them to be a bit this candid and say, look, it's not that we we don't care. Any death is a tragedy, but it's ultimately a business and it's done by the numbers. And so it just it just wasn't going to be something that completely changed the market and was worth the R&D investment and the marketing investment to make it viable. So for me, the penny dropped that unless you truly are able to operate as a charity, any product you put out there, it has to have a commercial circle connect. And so do bear that in mind uh, in, in where you're going and perhaps <clears throat> learn a little, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but learn a little bit from my joining the dots backwards, um, that it is, it is important to try and balance those things or indeed take something as a PR or, uh, you know, a, a political stance instead, if you think that's how you'd rather pitch it. So anyway, going through all those things, I really felt it was about finding your own journey. And as it happened, I thought chemistry was a complete waste of time, yet it was critical to helping me engage with a, a chemical engineering team in Sugru, and I was still able to resurrect some of the learnings um, from that degree. Um, the butchers, I'd always been kind of good with knives, but I actually got a lot better in the butchers. Um, and that, I think, helped me, because I was being taught how to use knives much more safely, I think it helped me teach better. Uh, when I started doing websites um, and YouTube videos. So uh, the R&D team, I mean, this was, you know, one of those weird things where a friend of mine who I'd helped in a workshop in Berlin in design modeling phoned me up and said, we had someone drop out of a, of a sort of inspirational talk series. Uh, you've got 48 hours to put together a presentation and be on a plane and turn up. Is that possible? And of course, you say yes when it's Lego. So, um, you know, that was back in 2015. And then 2017, I found myself with a job at Lego. So I thought that was just one of those points of sometimes saying yes, when you really haven't got, you know, kids and a family and all the pressures. I mean, really, sometimes saying yes is the best thing you can do at the beginning of your career. So applying yourself. 
uh, the sort of social networking. I kind of put this up just as I, I, I kind of thought you can only fake being interested in something so much. And I kind of feel like you've got to be really into it. Um, and that's worth a, a bit of an honest truth of yourself. Um, and because I, I think if you get it right, it is actually genuinely infectious. And it's not, you know, you're not faking it every day. So I ended up going to sort of networking events. I think, you know, when I look back at my course, I think for some of my peers, networking was considered quite a dirty word. LinkedIn was like, oh, it's sickening. And I, I can't say that I love LinkedIn, but I think it's it's doing the best way to solve a problem uh, of connecting with people. So, but but ultimately turning up to stuff and being, you know, in the moment um, and trusting a little bit of that serendipity that the people you meet, little did I know here that um, this was actually a sort of, was gonna be a great friend of mine who was running this, uh, Ian Zhang, and I ended up doing Big Life Fix with her. So you just don't know where these things really kick off. So again, online uh, networking, I guess it's worth to say, is that my website, I have huge respect for a chap called Pete Woods at RS Components, who when my videos were still under 200 views, uh, Pete had actually got in touch and said, do you want to do a project uh, with Raspberry Pi? And so uh, I think sometimes everyone's always gunning for that big viral spike but sometimes it's also worth saying that, that the quality is key as well. So Pete, Pete has been a continual red thread throughout, you know, almost the past decade uh, and just an absolute legend. So I can't praise him enough. Um, and I think he's one of those first, you know, community managers when no one knew what a social media community manager was. It was a joke job. And he like went through that grind to be in a much stronger place now. So huge respect to people like that. Um, so again, sharing that, um, and then job applications, research and development. So researching your target company, developing your approach to them. Uh, I don't think I've ever got a job from literally just a, there is a posting online, I applied for it, done. Um, quite often it's about, you know, understanding and developing yourself and, and realizing why you did certain things on your CV. So for example, me, uh, you know, I realized that, uh, you know, I value the ethics and brand of a company. And so I needed that to be a strong part of sort of why I applied for a company. Was I sort of ethically in tune with it? Um, <clears throat> I also felt that I could, I could work independently when I needed. It didn't necessarily mean I was going to run off and become an entrepreneur uh, right away. But I also knew that I, I tend to not just lead by pressure or intimidation, more by inspiration. Uh, when I lead a team. Uh, and I love working with people who sort of amaze and inspire me. And so I felt that when I was, you know, looking at sort of new, less intimidating things, you know, I kind of thought, how is it that I really go about, you know, achieving things differently? And so I wanted to sort of keep pushing and challenging myself. So I love the phrase by uh, Seth Godin, uh, be remarkable. And he sort of breaks this down to basically say, that it, it's one of those things of you need to be memorable, not not in the sense of you're unique in the world, but just would you sort of tell that down the pub? You say, yeah, I met this person, he or she was fantastic, I will pass a remark on them to my friend in the evening or my partner or my flatmate. And I kind of feel that's, that's a really good acid test is can someone remember the key beats of what you're about without too much complexity or it being too too weird? So again, I sort of thought, you know, for some of you, you know, if you're in, if you already got jobs, great. But if you're applying, I thought I'd at least not just <clears throat> make the mistake of how I apply now. Um, I thought I'd show how I genuinely did it back when I was a, a, an undergraduate. So this was when I, I lived in uh, Glasgow and I wanted to basically run through uh, you know, the first paragraph was really sort of like just laying down the basics. The second was a little bit, uh, you know, my values. And then the third paragraph was why I thought I would be a perfect candidate. And it sounds really, really obvious to just be formulaic and break it down into those steps. But do remember, it, the person who reads your cover letter is quite often the HR manager. It's not necessarily uh, going to be someone who is going to be, you, you know, your boss. 
So being explicit and, and clear about where you see your value and where you see the company's own journey, I think, you know, can't be understated enough. And so then on the second page, I don't think many sites usually advise this, but I thought I'd take a bit of a chance. And I, I looked at their website and they had all these little pictures about who they are. And, uh, you know, obviously each of the pictures spoke to them in some way. So I sort of photoshopped in my salmon fish because as everyone knows salmon swim upstream and it's a bit relentless and they're just frantic and crazy and trying to get there and I felt that that was the nearest thing to what I was at the time and so I thought it's a bit of fun so again I kind of thought it's not a too too terrible a joke but I was hoping that also the right company for me would be like I see what you did there that's a bit of fun this guy will probably not take himself too seriously and it will be good to work with so I kind of thought, you know, there's, it shows I can use Photoshop, I share your value of humour, I recognise hard work and persistence and I want to contribute. I hope that that was what was being encoded. And again, be memorable. If someone was sort of thinking, okay, which was the kid? Yeah, someone from Glasgow and he had that fish thing. It's quite easy to remember you. So again, more dots, knowing your audience. Um, I kind of wanted this as an example that often... It just seems like a great idea to, to go work for Apple, end of, um, if, if you're a design student. And I think quite often it's worth breaking down. You can, of course, do that. It's certainly something I looked at as well. Um, but I think it's worth also looking at the company image versus getting hired, because your folio doesn't have to emulate everything that they are today, because actually the really good companies are interested in what you're going to bring that will take them somewhere tomorrow. So the professionals, don't get me wrong, when you're in the professional game, they're craving the big, sexy results. You're, you're showing huge you know, revenues, flawless products, incredible ads, that's the sort of thing. Graduates, you're showing your process. And I think it's really important not to get carried away looking at the Johnny Ives of this world and thinking, my folio should look like that. Of course it's not going to, and if Johnny Ive, I'd love to know actually if he has, please include in the link if anyone finds it, but if Johnny Ive has his graduate folio, that would be incredible to see. So I think as well, legends tend to sort of, you know, move away from like, here's my little 10 deck folio, I'm pretty sure Johnny Ive doesn't have one, um, but you see him speak about the philosophy and the impact that he either has or aspires to have, and so I think again, are you at legend status or are you at graduate status so I think sure a sprinkling of philosophy and aspiration and a little bit of trying to do something and emulate you know the the big boys but I think at the end of the day you know your folio needs to show a lot of process and I think if you're in doubt of that take a quick call with one of the hiring managers and say which do you want to see more of you know lots of sexy hero shots or process of me testing it and I think you're going to get a pretty consistent answer so tell me if I'm wrong. So what that means is while you're at university, document the heck out of your concepts and your design process. One of the best things I ever did at uni was spend £200 on a waterproof and drop-proof camera. And it just meant it got taken everywhere. It went on fishing trawlers. It got put in blood and guts. It got dropped in sewers, everything. And so I think this is one of the best things you can possibly do. And that, that you know, classic uh, photographer phrase of the best camera is the best camera you have on you. That is totally true. You are going to miss it if you lug around a DSLR camera. If you've got a good waterproof phone, as technology has obviously moved on a little bit since uh, I was a student, take it everywhere and accept that it's going to get smashed sometimes. <clears throat> so <clears throat> how do you basically say, I love your company? So... I kind of thought one of the things as well, I didn't want to just have pro forma um, portfolio. And so I put, you know, in InDesign, I edited it every single time, uh, the company here and the role I was applying for. And I think even though it's, it seems a small, subtle thing, it just literally showed this isn't just any folio I, I flung at any company and that was the end of it. I genuinely went through and handpicked the things that I'd wanted to show. And so again, too long, didn't read. Uh, it sounds crazy, but if you have a long folio, as I did, in hindsight, I wouldn't advise having too long a folio, um, but I did put a contents page, which I feel was at least a sort of happy medium of acknowledging that people have 
not that much time and so they can skim read and get a feel of what I was about and of course as your eye skims over it you see medical California uh you know firefighting robots whiskey uh packaging assistive human factors and personal interests and so it's quite easy to just be like even if you looked at nothing else you'd get a flavor of what I was about so Showing depth, uh, as you can see in the in the corner here in the top left, uh, this was one of five. So there's five sheets going into detail about my NHS project, all the sort of crappy sketches, uh, graphs of tests and things that I did, um, going through to sort of the prototyping phase, and of course, you know, getting a few awards, which was always good, but always coming back to the engineering and the human factors. And so I kind of felt that was that was a good example of showing that. But the breadth is important. So this is much smaller things of uh, whiskey packaging, environmentally friendly light bulbs back in the day uh, when that was that was still big news. Uh, you know, looking at blood pressure monitoring and the sort of human factors around that. Uh, working in Hong Kong, trying to design a new light bulb that was easy to take out if you had osteoarthritis. Um, firefighting robots, as I mentioned, and again, showing the diversity. Um, I think this usually tones down a little bit more as you get more professional, um, or at least it exists in other channels or, or blogs or whatever. But I think just showing that you get up to a bunch of stuff and you're not just a in the groove, I only do exams and my course. I'll be honest, you know, Having been hired and having hired graduates myself, I, I definitely want ones that I think are going to be good, but I also think they're going to be fun. They're going to be nice, exciting people to, for the team to come and meet. Uh, and so I think, you know, you're allowed to over-index a little bit on that in hindsight. I don't think it was such a tragedy to, to put three pages, even though I think it probably should have been one. So, more dots. Taking risk. So presenting to the uh, directors at Lego, um, I can kind of say this, I guess, now that I've left, but my, I decided, decided to go, well, I could do lots of sort of very PowerPoint-y, uh, slick graphics, but I'm not actually killer at graphics, but I am quite good because essentially at Dyson, it was beaten into me to be able to draw quickly and not be precious. I can actually crank out a, a Sharpie sketch on a post-it, I think, with the best of them. So... Um, I kind of thought, well, what happens if we, you know, embrace that and say, well, actually, children aren't precious. And so my, my folio should still have good content, but the actual format should be fast and sort of a little bit light touch. So I went through the whole thing doing it on Sharpies with just, you know, a couple of colors. And so I was showing that this was my sort of approach uh, in process. I mean, it's a little bit hackneyed and, and, and cliched, but it's kind of true, the whole messy thing and then figuring out something. Um, I also thought that it was worth breaking down my current approach to the to the job that I'm as interested in the market as in the technology and I think in some ways in hindsight it's always a little bit of a risk because people like to hire you sometimes just as a sort of a, a single thing to solve a problem and so usually you're a marketeer or you're a, an engineer and I was trying to say I care equally about the two and I think Dyson was a huge influence on that if you look at Dyson projects as much as you know, maybe in the past they used to say the engineering sells itself. I think we all know with the standard of their marketing is is, is exceptional. Um, and certainly if you looked at the, the hiring that migrated over to certain fruit companies, you know, it, it, it's fair to say these things are impressive when you see where people go for jobs. So, um, yeah, so I was looking for breaking down the elemental, the enabling and the evolving and sort of what I meant by those in terms of sort of pain points or industrial things versus emergent trends, new technology, social change, and fringe science. And so what I was really trying to do was say, look, I, I like operating at both of these levels. And so I put some case studies to sort of, you know, not just put it all in words. And I said, well, I was interested in a really great book called The Theory of Fun by Ralph uh, Costa. If you haven't read it, please do. I think it's one of the best primers. And I say this even having been at Lego, I still believe it's one of the best primers on how to how to sort of uh, understand the, 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 the process of creating a playful experience. Um, even though it is for computer games, I think it's, it's still totally applicable to, to, to physical products as well. Um, I also sort of just brought in some case studies on like Tamagotchi and Furby and Bots Alive, Cosmo at the time before it closed, 
of things that I thought were interesting, good talking points, some of which people bought, you know, said, yep, let's talk about this, and some of them were ignored, but it's fine, it's just showing that they're engaging with things. Um, you know, talking about the beginning of sort of, you know, Logo by Seema Papert, again, what I was trying to do was say, I know that you know Seema Papert is a big deal because he underpinned a huge amount of your fundamental approach uh, to, to designing, uh, you know, essentially STEM before it was STEM. And also I knew that MIT was a really big deal, so putting in things like Rodney Brooks's Baxter robot, which rather than it being programmed by line of codes, you simply move the arm about of the robot and it learns. So again, showing that this was my approach to technology I think was helpful. Um, and again, I think it's one of those things where you'll never truly know what's going on in people's head, but I got the job, so it can't have been too terrible. Um, so the hidden appeal, I thought I'd break it down as well. Again, having having applied and having hired people, I think often graduates, again, this is back to the Apple point of, you know, you see a glossy website, is that really what people are buying? And and I feel that, you know, when it's uh, an employee and a mentor, you know, it's it's really all about the experience. Um, you know, they're awesome at managing difficult stuff, loads of resources, clients, reputation, stability, all these big, heavy things. But when you come back to a, uh, an intern or a graduate, it, you know, quite often the thing you always hear in the office is like, oh my gosh, I hadn't even heard of that. You know, kids these days and you're you're only in your 30s and you already feel old. Um, but I remember being in California and, and there's a guy called Mike and he was trying to convert everyone to use this platform called Twitter. And no one could understand why you'd want to say something with only 140 characters and that most of the stuff people were writing was absolute rubbish. And Mike was just absolutely, you know, dug his heels in. And even though he was a young intern, had like no real influence in the company, he was still like, I'm telling you guys, you're not getting it. This is going to be big. And you know, I think this is why you got to have young people in the company because, you know, the old guys didn't get it uh, by and large. And I, I kind of love the fact that they still had enough sense, you know, to get people like him in and then go, hang on a minute, maybe Mike's got something. And so, again, I think that's why I loved working at places like Spec Design because they get it. Um, and as I said, think differently, willing to learn, not conventional, unaware of the limitations, and also just to be super blunt, and I don't mean this to be rude to anyone, but you're cheap. You're way cheaper than the, 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 the big expensive consultants. Now, the flip side of it is, is that, you know, any boss will tell you you're usually a little bit harder to manage because you make mistakes. But most people, when you're looking at a budget, you can't afford to put... You know, and, and sometimes a professional person will be like in the range of three, four, five times more expensive than than an intern. And that's just the way it is. And so if you wanted a little sideline project to be explored and it's within the capabilities of a graduate, a smart manager will know how to leverage that and get it done. And then they bring to bear their experience and critique to lift it to the next level. So again, let's just be honest, if you haven't got a family, it really doesn't matter whether you've got to be put on a red-eye flight out to a factory, you just wing it and do it. Um, whereas, you know, people are more reluctant as they've got those commitments in life. Um, so I think as well, recognise you have a big advantage. And I, I think quite a lot of people think, oh, I was picked because I'm so fabulous. And you're like, you were picked because you haven't got a family and you're good enough. So I think just recognise that advantage. So again, new working methods. At the time, I'd just come out of Norway and was getting all excited about life cycle analysis or circular economy, as it's more uh, commonly called. And, you know, there was quite a few of us there who were going, this is important. We've got to design in this way. And of course, it still takes years for that to drip feed through companies. And, and, and of course, legislation changes. So I think new perspectives are very exciting. And I think the best companies know how to strike a balance between the uh, the lack of experience that uh, a student has, but also the, the 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 willingness to try new stuff. So, uh, you know, employees think graduate is awesome uh, because they get to do crazy stuff they'd like to do but can't with low risk or low cost. And the intern and graduate should not assume that inexperience is the weakness. Attitude is more desirable than talent alone. And I. Yeah, feel free to correct me if there's people who are employers here who disagree, but I think attitude really does hold hold true, especially when it's just an internship. So 
putting the dream team together, as I alluded, the graduate bringing all the new stuff, the mentor bringing to bear that experience and that ability to keep things from falling off the edge of the cliff and knowing how to also pitch them to investors. You know, I was certainly one of those like, you know, over enthusiastic, you know, uh, believe that everything had to be important. And then, of course, you realize you're the worst person to pitch to a client. And that's why they let some of the more senior people do the pitch, because they're able to tone down a little bit that enthusiasm. Um, and so don't don't be offended, I'd say, if it would be advice to my earlier self when someone says that's good, but we're going to take it from here. Just go with that and learn. More dots. Um, and giving things a go. So uh, I guess I just wanted to share some little final stories of a year in Norway. Um, we had this funny thing in our university, which was that essentially it was it was kind of made pretty clear to us early on by the Tudors that only the best can go in the class. And that it was just the fairest way to do it, that grades were the selection. And so I ended up thinking, I, I mean, I assure you, I, I hadn't been tested for uh, dyslexia at that point, my grades were not particularly good for a whole number of reasons, but I ended up thinking, well, it, I'll always kick myself if I don't apply. And so myself and a really good friend of mine also applied, who, who happened to actually be really quite good at exams. So I thought, well, he's all right, but that'll be a shame um, if it doesn't work out. But as it happens, I got a place and I was completely shocked. I was like, God, you know what? Who did I, who did I beat to get this? Um, you know, I sort of had like B's, C's and D's, uh, and, and it turned out that my tutor said, well, yeah, there was two places and only two people applied. So you got it. And I was like, oh, fantastic. So I think, you know, if it's not taking you weeks and weeks of work or tons of money, definitely just apply. Um, the other thing I'd share is a little bit of a sort of, uh, a little secret that I sort of honed over the years. I, I'm sure it's not original, but, um, I'm probably blowing my cover now. But I, I'd use this phrase of like, I'm in town next Friday on business. And so quite often um, when you when you want to go visit a company, they're a bit busy. But if you say like, look, I'm, I'm going to be in town next Friday. I'm doing something important, but could I just come visit you for a, for a pint or a coffee or whatever? Um, and it's just one of those things where people sort of, I don't know why, the human psychology of it, they just think, oh, well, I guess if he is traveling over, it'd be a little bit decadent to say he's got to spend another train ticket to come visit us. So they go, oh, okay, it's a Friday, it's quiet anyway, or dare I say, I think Thursday is a new Friday in London, just as a bit of a heads up, uh, as I think a lot of people work from home. So maybe see which works best. But, but actually then when people said, oh, go on then, we'll see you at three o'clock and we can get a beer. Um, I basically book the ticket and go. Um, and so I think, again, just that little bit of a nudge and trying to sort of game it sometimes works in your favour. So I guess it's not a terrible lie, but it's a little lie. Um, again, Ieste, as I said, check it out. The one-to-one -one exchange is just terrific as a platform for getting on that ladder of uh, your first opportunity. So have nothing to lose in trying it. And uh, as I said, final thank you to Mike Sharp, who was the person who actually got me into the IS Day thing, um, because that was actually my old university, and he was willing to take a student in chemistry, and I was able to do engineering and product design in Hong Kong. So I really think it's a great one, and I hope that, if nothing else, is a really useful tip. So please leave comments if you have any other questions, um, and I hope it's useful. Thanks a lot. Bye.